in other videos, we've talked about reasoning through scientific experiments, controlled experiments, inductive reasoning, and variety of contexts. When we explore causation, we are typically using inductive reasoning as well, but it's really important to think about types of causes. Causation can be very complicated. So when we say that A causes B, we have different meanings according to the context, and we need to figure that out. We need to sort out what type of causation we're talking about. So because of the variety of meanings that are possible when we're talking about causation, it's really important to distinguish the types of causes when we are exploring causation. So in this video, we're looking at a variety of types of causes. So one is a proximate cause. This is the causal factor in a causal network that's the nearest in time or space to the effect. So we have a series of causes or a complex causal network that's bringing about an effect, and this is the last one, right? If A causes B, B causes C, C causes D, and we're making this linear, but it doesn't necessarily have to be linear, then while A and B are clearly causes of D, only C is the proximate cause of D. It's that last one in time or space that brings about D. So even something as simple as putting pen to the paper is a proximate cause of the writing on the page. What caused that note to be written? You could say putting the pen to the paper. That would be the proximate cause. Again, it's the last physical process that actually accomplishes the writing. Now clearly, if we're talking about writing on a paper, uh, there is much thought, preparation, uh, other things going on that causes the writing to be there and are related to the writing, but it's that physical process of putting the pen to the paper that is the proximate cause. A necessary causal condition can be described by this formula. So if C is a necessary causal condition for E, then without C, E would not occur. C must be there in order to get the effect E. So if E occurred, we know that C was there. We know that C also occurred. An example of this would be the presence of gas that supports a flame, typically oxygen, for example, in a normal flame from a candle, for example. So the presence of gas is a necessary condition for the flame, for the fire. If we say something like water causes growth, and we're referring to a living organism, that what we're talking about is water is a necessary cause of growth for the living organism. If you think of animals or even humans. We have to have water to grow. So it's, it must be there. It's a requirement. Another example might be what caused the mold to grow in the basement? You could say, well, water caused uh, the mold to grow. Because there was water there, the mold grew. But it's just a necessary condition. There had to be mold spores there. There had to be certain lighting conditions as well. So water would be the necessary condition. Sufficient causal conditions may be described by the form, if C is a sufficient condition for E, a causal condition for E, then whenever C occurs, E occurs. When we have the cause, the effect will be there. So uh, fire causes light. When you have the flame, when you have the fire, the presence of fire, that's a sufficient cause of light, the effect will follow. Sufficient causes are more rare to identify, they're more difficult to isolate, and we'll talk about a couple more reasons for that when we get to our next uh, couple types of causes. And so it's, it's hard to actually identify a specific cause that on its own will bring about the effect. A deterministic cause is 
is a sufficient causal condition. So it's a, we, we won't really worry about this and focus on it much, but it's a, it is a type of sufficient cause. And the idea here is that it's going to guarantee that particular outcome. There's, there's no way that it could be interrupted between the cause and the effect. So sometimes when people talk about a deterministic cause, they're talking about a sufficient cause. Those, those are nearly identical. We'll just say that the deterministic cause has that guarantee to it. A probabilistic cause, as you might imagine, when you have C, the cause is there, the probability of the effect occurring increases. So when you have C, the likelihood that you will have E increases. So the probability increases more than it would in the absence of C. Now we also need to add this clause. C is not a necessary or a sufficient cause. So sometimes you might, it technically uh, a cause might fit into our definition of a necessary cause or even sufficient cause, and it would increase the probability that E would occur. But if we can identify it as a sufficient cause or a necessary cause, that is a more clear type of causation. And so we should use it, put it into those two, one of those two categories if it fits there. Only when it doesn't fit into one of those two categories do we call it a probabilistic cause. Examples include studying hard for a quiz. When you do that, that increases the probability of a high score. Now notice in this case, it's not necessary. You could have attended the lecture and were very attentive and, and, and remembered everything and, and did, got a perfect score due to that. It's not sufficient. One could study hard for a quiz, but then uh, somehow forget something on the day of the quiz or make a mistake and put the wrong answer, answer too quickly. So that, that would be a case where it's not necessary or sufficient, but it does increase the probability. Another example would be being extremely tired increases the probability of poor judgment. So somebody might say they, they made a poor judgment because they were tired. That would be a probabilistic cause. Okay, so a few helpful hints when we're identifying causes before we go on and and mention a couple other types of causes. Again, repeat, uh, do not identify a cause as probabilistic or proximate or any of the others we, we haven't gotten to yet, unless you've already ruled out the possibility that it's a necessary or sufficient cause. So look for something to be a necessary or sufficient cause first, and only then if it's not, you go on to consider the other possibilities. First, that's what you do, right? So whenever you're given a situation where you have to identify the cause, you, you question, is this a necessary cause? Is this a sufficient cause? Only if it's not one of those two do you go on and consider other possible types of causes. Now, one other thing, when we're identifying the type of cause, be sure to recognize what's being proposed as the cause and what is the effect? So students sometimes get those blurred and, and sometimes these can be stated as negatives. You have a negative cause like a lack of sleep or a negative effect like not showing up for class, things like that. Make sure you're really clear on what is the cause and what is the effect. You have to do that in order to categor, categorize the cause in the proper way. All right. Let's move on to some of the other types of causes. We can combine a couple of these and identify individually necessary and jointly sufficient causal conditions. And this is extremely helpful when we're, we're trying to be really clear about a concept, be really clear about what brings something about. So for example, if A, B, and C are all necessary, they're individually necessary, and if they are all together sufficient, when you have all three of them, they're sufficient to cause D, then when you have A, B, and C, and each are causally necessary for D, 
then ED does in fact occur. So individually, if you're just talking about B, it's a necessary cause of D, but when you have A, B, and C together, they are, as a group, sufficient to cause D. So for example, having water, a suitable temperature, oxygen, nutrients from the soil, carbon dioxide, if it's not on the list, light, um, these things are necessary and jointly sufficient for the germination of grass seeds. Now, I'm not a botanist, maybe I left something else out, but you see what we have, right? You identify all the necessary things, and then together, if they produce the effect in question, then you have the individually necessary and jointly sufficient causes. The seventh one is a modification of sufficient. So sometimes we would think something sufficient, you know, you do that and you get the effect. But there has to be given a background of accepted, stable, necessary conditions in order for that to be sufficient. Um, the description's in the name, right? So just our label, sufficient given a background of accepted, stable, necessary conditions, that tells us what we're, what we're looking at. An example here would be flipping on a light. So you, you flip the light switch and the light comes on. It, you could call it sufficient, but you know that doesn't happen every time. Sometimes the bulb's burned out or sometimes there's a power outage. So you have to assume there's these accepted, stable, necessary conditions that are present. So flipping the switch is sufficient for light given that we have a working bulb in the fixture and the electricity is properly connected and working properly. So these things are usually the case. When I come into my office, it's usually the case. The bulb and the fixture is functional, there's a, a supply of electricity, and so you flip the light switch and the light comes on. The last cause that we will consider is that of an agent cause. Sometimes instead of an event or set of events, a person, or we, as we call an agent, is the cause of something. And this always involves an intentional action. So that's what we're talking about, a person acting as a person, acting as an agent. So example, uh, for example, Frock has a broken nose because have not punched it. Have nogs the cause of the broken nose? Well, that would be an agent cause. Okay, let's consider some applications here. So uh, we've covered the material. If you want to take a brief quiz here or, or put it into application, continue on. So let's consider a couple scenarios. Suppose I'm late for class and I say that the electric company is the cause. I explained there was a power failure, my alarm clock did not go off. If I'm doing this, what type of cause am I talking about? Or suppose my car won't start because it's out of gas, right? So I say, being out of gas caused my car not to stop. Or suppose I put gas in the car and say that caused it to start. If you want to think about those more carefully, pause for a moment. Okay, let's continue on and, and think through the answers here. So the first one, you're late for class because the uh, no electricity, so the alarm didn't go off. Of course, with most cell phones, that's kind of irrelevant, but uh, that would be sufficient given normal, accepted, stable, necessary background conditions, right? If things are going as normal, ceteris paribus, uh, if your alarm doesn't go off, you'll end up sleeping through it. Okay, the car not starting because it's out of gas. Well, that would be a sufficient cause. It, if there's no gas in the car at all, it typically, uh, if we're talking about just not a hybrid or not an electric car, we're talking about a typical gas powered car, then not having gas will be sufficient for it not starting. 
And then finally, if you put gas in the car and that causes it to start, that would be necessary. If you wanna have a few more examples, we can continue. Uh, suppose my car won't start because I left the lights on. A little different scenario. Or suppose uh, Katie Ledecky legally swims faster than everyone else in the race, and that causes her to win the gold medal. Or the morning of the race, the pool was drained. And fortunately, it was later filled with water. And somebody might say, well, she only won because there was water in the pool. Well, let's think through these. Uh, my car won't start because I left the lights on. That would probably be sufficient given accepted normal stable background conditions that are necessary. So, it, of course, it depends on how long the lights were left on. If it were overnight, that probably would be enough to drain the battery and cause the car not to start. Uh, the legally swimming faster than everyone in the race would cause it to win the gold medal. That's a sufficient cause. Uh, F, we're talking about a necessary cause, right? You have to have water in the pool in order for uh, the her to win the race. Two more situations. Uh, suppose there's a conversation going on. Somebody says, what brought you to New York? And the person answers, a plane. Or over 80% of the subjects in the study reported feeling energized after drinking Red Bull. And we conclude Red Bull causes a feeling of being energized. Well, what causes are we talking about here? Well, in the first case, kind of a, a snide remark, but that would be the proximate cause, right? I'm sure there would be plenty of other causes for the person to get on the plane. The plane would just be the last cause in a causal nexus. And hopefully you recognize H as a probabilistic cause. It increases the likelihood that somebody would feel energized. If you want more practice, you can consider uh, examples in a typical logical, logic textbook, critical reasoning textbook will give you plenty of examples to practice. 